from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, my God is worthy to be praised. Has he done anything for you? Hallelujah. Has he brought you out? Has he healed your body? Hallelujah. Is there anything too hard for my God? Nothing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our Father and our God. God, we thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. For your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So, God, we thank you in this anointing. We thank you in this anointing, God, that in worship, you have already done the work. God, in our praise, God, you have already got the glory. God, in our worship, God, you have already took our sacrifice of praise and took it, God, as a offering unto you. So, God, we give you the glory. We give you the praise. And, God, we thank you for this word that you've given me on today, God. Let it go forth with power and with might. We'll be so careful to give your name the glory, the praise, and the honor. It's in these things that we say it's done in Jesus' name. Before you take your seats, greet somebody that beside you. You don't know them, but tell them I'm glad to see you in the building. Hallelujah. Greet somebody on your other side and say, I'm glad to see you this morning. You may be seated all over the sanctuary. We certainly honor God and the spirit of God that dwells in this house. And we thank God for our leader. Amen. While you're yet sitting, come on, let's send up a sound all the way across town to our leader. Amen. Our pastor, Pastor Keon Henderson, we honor him and we love him. And our lady, Shawnee, we love her. Amen. Come on and give God praise for my brother, Brother Torrance. Amen. Pastor Torrance is in the building with us. We honor him. Didn't God just use him just to usher the spirit of God in? Amen. Come on. Come on. Let's give the baddest praise and worship team on this side of heaven the greatest hand clap. Come on. Come on. Give them a standing ovation. Hallelujah. We honor you. All of our singers, our band. Amen. Man, they just know how to do it. We know how to do it. Amen. We thank God for Lady Hammond. Come on. Let's celebrate her. Amen. We love her. Amen. I thank God for you. I thank God for her. I thank God for all the ladies that came out on yesterday for New Year, new expectations. It was wonderful. Amen. I was ear hustling in the hall. No, seriously. Amen. It was, a, it was an awesome time, and we've got rave reviews, and we thank God for that. Amen. There's a word from God on today, and uh, this worship, man, was just so enlightening to me. Um, because of this, of this, of this topic, Amen. We're gonna. I want you to turn to your Bibles today. Amen. Turn to your Bibles. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God, we thank you. God, we thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Turn with me to the Book of Mark. book of Mark chapter 5. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I want you to think about this topic on today as we begin to read this scripture. Amen. The book of Mark chapter 5. And we're going to start. Amen. We're going to start. Amen. At verse 21. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. And the Bible says that when Jesus had crossed again over in the boat to the other side, it wasn't just the lake that he was crossing over. He crossed over to the other side of a large body of water known as a sea. The Bible says a large crowd gathered around him, and so he stayed there by the seashore. And while he was there, one of the synagogue was an official there. His name was Jairus. He came up to him, seeing him. Uh, isn't it illustrative today that sometimes people will not know you but see something in you? It's those people that they don't know you, but they see something in you so great that they'll begin to pour into you. He sees Jesus not knowing him, but knowing the capacity of who Christ was. He came up to him, seeing him. He fell at his feet and begged anxiously with him, saying, 
my little daughter is at the point of death. He says, please, I'm reading from the Amplified, please come and lay your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. Something about a parent that, that has the importance of knowing uh, the care for their children. He says, even at the point of my daughter dying, I beg you, sir, please come and lay hands on her because I believe if you touch her, she will not only be healed, but she shall live. I want to stop right there because some of us are in here and we are believing that for ourselves. That God, if you can just come right now and touch me, not only will I be healed, but I live. How many people want to live? Amen. I just don't want to be healed, but I want life, hallelujah, and life more abundantly. He says, come, and she will be healed and live. And Jesus went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in around him from all sides. And there, while in the press, a woman was there in the crowd who had suffered a hemorrhage. 12 years. This man needs a breakthrough for his daughter. She's about to die. And now somebody else has the audacity to get in the way. What do you do when your blessing is on pause? She has a need. But does her need outweigh his need? What's the rationale in this, that, that who goes first? <laughs> she endured much suffering at the hands of many physicians. They couldn't heal her. She spent all she had, and none of them helped her at all. Not only did not, they not help her, but the Bible says her condition got worse. What do you do when you thought you went to the answer? And the answer didn't help. What do you do when you thought you had got to your promised land only to find out it was a desert? The Bible says she spent all she had. Her condition became worse. But when she heard about the reports about Jesus, she came up from behind him in the crowd and touched him and his garment. For she thought, she said, if I just touch his clothes, I will get well. While you're taking your seat, I want you to lean to your neighbor and tell them, say, neighbor, neighbor, there is a weight in the waiting. You may be seated. There is a weight in the waiting. There is a weight in the waiting. If you begin to look at these words, the weight, W-E-I-G-H-T. I had to make sure for any teachers in here I was spelling that correctly. <laughs> that there is literally a gravitational pull that happens while you're in the W-A-I-T. That while we are believers, and everybody in here is a believer, while you're believing on God to perform miracles for you, while you're in anticipation for God to give you miracle signs and wonders, and although you believe God and what God can and will do for your life, that does not negate the fact that there is a W-E-I-G-H-T that you have to endure. And it's the weight of our weight that proves not only who you are, but it proves who God is for your life. It's in these moments that we learn how to wait. Even as a baby coming out of a mother's womb, the baby does not know time, but yet the baby does not know how to wait when it's time to eat. <laughs> when a baby is born... He or she does not know that, that the mama is sleep, and as a matter of fact, probably sleep de deprived, uh, if I say that correctly, uh, being deprived from sleep. Uh, the baby doesn't know that, that, that the dad is out working. All the baby knows is, I'm hungry. 
And that baby, he or she is not going to wait on the conditions to be right. The baby just going to cry because it's hungry. And how many of us in our lives, we, we live life not understanding that there are some things you just got to learn to wait on. We, le- we learn to wait. It said on average we spend about 32 minutes every time we go to the doctor's office in what's called the waiting room. <laughs> you had an appointment, and, and you, it never failed that once you got there, you said my appointment was at 2, but, but why are you just now seeing me at 2.45? Because even in the waiting, even though that you had a set time, there are sometimes conditions before you that have to be settled before you get in into the place called the examining room. You got to learn to wait. If you're a traveler, it said that you spend about 28 minutes on average in the airport in line. And for some of us that don't like to wait in the airport line, they've, they've created an avenue or a mechanism called pre-check that you can uh, fast forward through the line. And if you're like me who can be a little impatient even with pre-check, you go into the airport not only with just a boarding pass, but you got pre-check and something else called clear. (laughs) Tyrone said both of them. (laughs) Because waiting causes frustrating, frustration. Waiting, in some cases, can even cause pain. Most brothers in here will testify that on average we spend about 21 minutes for our significant other to get ready when it's time to go out to have a good time. And all the brothers, if you're with me, come on, make some noise. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's on average about 21 minutes. Baby, can you zip me up? We should have been gone. I just need five more minutes. Five turns to ten. Ten turns to twenty. I just got to get my lashes right. (laughs) Ten turns to twenty. Baby, we got a reservation. They'll be okay. We got a 15-minute grace period. Why? Because we get used to the effects of waiting. When you live in a city like Houston, you spend on average about 38 minutes a day in traffic. Tired of it. 38 minutes of your day of non-productiveness, sitting and riding in traffic. And so you got to understand that when you're in a waiting period, you got to learn to t- turn your improductivity into a place of productivity. There are times when I'm in traffic, I I just don't sit back and let anger get a hold of me because somebody cut in front of me, uh, and it it does sometimes, and pray for my deliverance. But, But what I do most of the time, I try to turn on something that I can hear and put in my spirit because while I'm in the wait, I need something that's gonna happen on the inside of me. While I'm in the wait, I need something that's gonna take my mind off of where I am. And who am I talking to in this place? You're in the wait for God to do something in your life. You're in the wait for God to do miracles signs and wonders, but I'm here to tell you today that you need God to take your mind off of what you're waiting for. Somebody said, I got to take my mind off of it. So we, we spend time waiting, and we spend time in places of wait. I told you about the doctor's office. We spend time waiting for somebody to return our call. We spend time looking at the phone, waiting for that little cloud bubble to see if they're really messaging me or not. And when they don't, we we go, and and for those that are uh, are privileged, we go and look at location services to see uh, where are you and why are you not contacting me because I just can't wait for you to get here. We wait in different places. Some of us are waiting for the right person to say I do to. That was just one amen. I think it should be some more amens in here on that one. How many people waiting to say I hear I do? Amen, amen. Some of us wait for the shower to get to the right temperature. If you like Lady Hammond, she wanted hot stove hot. Burn your skin off kind of hot. I just can't do it. I let her go first and let me get the cool water. We wait. We can't wait. We can't wait. We go to places where uh, it is known for, for speed to be paramount. That's why the difference between going to Jack in the Box and Chick-fil-A. You can wait in Jack in the Box 
uh, for for a good uh, uh, a nice biscuit or a nice uh, that they got that French toast with the cheese and the egg and all that on it. Praise God, uh, and a nice hash brown. Uh, I get Lauren the iced coffee. I get the regular coffee. But I, when I go to Jack in the Box, I know already I got to wait on that. But I already know when I go to Chick Fil A, they got five or maybe ten lines. With 30 people outside waiting to take my order. And not only are they anticipating not for me having a wait, but they're teaching me and greeting me with the act of kindness, my pleasure. Will that be anything on? You want to scan your app today? Yes, I do. But there's places of waiting. But even in the place of waiting, it's most important to understand as humans, we don't like to wait. I'm going to date myself. When we go back and look at the evolution of the Internet, for some of us who grew up in the auspices of when the Internet became a thing, when the Internet first came out, and I'm going to teach our young people something that don't know this, when the Internet first came up, you just didn't pull up a browser and it, and it went on. When we first had the Internet, you had, you had a computer. But if your computer didn't have something called a modem, you didn't weren't going nowhere. A computer with no modem was like having a phone with no service. All you could do was play games. So you may have had a computer, but if, if you didn't have the money for a modem, then you wasn't getting on the Internet. But God, when I got a modem, my daddy worked for IBM. He said, I'm going to send you a computer. Uh, and, and side note, I hadn't met my daddy until I was 21. And when I met him, uh, in my mind, I thought that he was going to give me everything, my natural father. I've got my daddy in here, right here, my stepfather. Come on and give God praise for him. My natural father, I didn't meet him until I was 21. But in my mind, I thought because I was meeting him in that moment that he was going to do everything he didn't do at that, in that time. I waited for that. I waited with an anticipation of what I thought I needed and thought I wanted for a man who was never there. When not realizing, even in my wait for something that was natural, God gave me something that was supernatural, and God sent a stepfather that was going to be more than my natural father ever was or could be in my life. And that's why you got to anticipate and thank God for the wait, because when you think you want what you want, God will send you what you need. And who am I talking to in this building this morning that you've been in a place of waiting and wanting from God, but God says, I need you to learn how to wait in your wait. And so, and so, and so, uh, I, I thought, man, he worked for IBM. He made a lot of money, and I thought, man, I'm about to be balling. At that time, I was wearing McGregor sneakers. <laughs> and I was like, man, I'm going to give me some J's now. <laughs> it didn't happen. I'm 21. And I'm married and struggling. And the only thing he sent me was a laptop, black and white at that. He sent me the laptop. I was grateful. I get the modem, and now I'm on the Internet. This is when AOL was popping. And, and see, when you had to connect to the Internet, you had to connect to it. And then you heard this song, this sound. That lets you know that your connection was good. See, sometimes in the wait, if you don't hear something, you need to understand that when God is connecting you to something that's higher than you in the heavenly place, you'll start hearing a sound. And sometimes in your wait, that's God letting you know, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man what God has for you. But God, if I wait on you, I'll start hearing you when I can't hear you any other time. Who am I talking to today that God is yet speaking to you and letting you know, I'm making it worth your while in the wait. So now I was on the internet. I thought I was doing something. I was on Black Planet and I was doing all this kind of stuff. I, I, I was, I was, I was doing, doing, kind of looking up stuff and and I was on all these kind of uh, kind of networks and and doing this and that. And I birthed, I birthed this uh, this ministry of prayer requests and I began to do all these different things uh, on on the internet. And then I had to realize that there was more to waiting than just waiting to get online, to wait to get this gratification of what I thought I was looking up or thought I needed to explore. Somebody said there's more to the wait. 
You know the evolution of phone calls. Phone calls had an evolution. When I grew up, we had a phone with a long cord on it that stretched for five different rooms in your house. And if you was dating in school and you wanted your girlfriend to call you, you had to wait. You had to tell her, baby, I'll be home at 525. And you had to wait for that phone to ring. And if you had siblings or somebody else, you better run to that phone and be the first one to answer it. The phone ring and say, hey, what you doing? Why? Because you were in anticipation of the call. But then when, when time evolved, you went from having to run to the phone, you had something called an answering machine. I'm giving y'all some history today. When you had an answering machine, the old-fashioned kind had a tape that went in it. And you had to rewind the tape to hear the message that was left. I'm, t I'm talking to some of y'all in this generation right now. I'm coming up to some of y'all young people in a minute. You had to leave a message on a tape. And rewind it to hear the message. And when you thought you hear, heard what you didn't hear, you had to rewind it again. And say, Let me see what they said they said they was. Yeah. And don't write over the message you wanted to keep. Man. I used to save my tapes. I had, when I wanted affirmations from when she called me and said, you just look so good. You so handsome. I just, I say that tape right there when I want to hear that. Put that tape in. Oh, you so handsome. You look so good. <laughs> Waiting. Wanting. Then we evolved from answering machines to having, while we wait, when we call people, we had something called a ringtone. And before we had that, uh, you, we were so smart, we would wait till Video Soul came on, and we would take the phone and put it by the TV and record... <laughs> Record, record the music so, so while, while they were waiting to leave a message, they could hear some good music. Some of y'all bear with me with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all played y'all song and said, you have reached the voicemail of Damon D. Hammond. And so some of y'all sanctified. You have reached the Holy Ghost headquarters where burdens are removed and yokes are destroyed in Jesus' name. <laughs> I used to hate calling people like that, like it. Why you can't have a regular voicemail? But we evolved from that to ringtones. And, and one of our favorite rappers, Soldier Boy, he, he was the inventor of the ringtone. And we would, we would buy, spend $4.99 on, a, on ringtones and have a ringtone for everybody in your phone. You didn't went in debt to have a song for everybody that calls your phone only to know who was calling you. This is before caller ID. I knew you by your song. If it was my mama late in the midnight hour, God going to. If it was Marcy calling, I don't know what that song was. Watch this. But in our wait, we wanted to be entertained more than enlightened. Because it's hard to be in your wait and don't feel the weights of what you are waiting for. And so when you are being weighted in the weight, you'll settle for being entertained more than you are being enlightened. Because let me tell you that in your weight is the time that you got to enlighten yourself. In your weight for the business to start, that is the time that you got to begin to do the research on how to do this business. In your weight to find your Boaz is the time that you got to get yourself together. In the weight to find, hallelujah, your Sarah is the time that you got to get your credit straight. And you get a home. To bring her to. I'm talking good today. I'm talking good today. In your wait, hallelujah, to get to go to college, you got to start researching scholarships. It's what I do in the wait that matters more than what entertains me in the wait. Who am I talking to today that you say, I'll push away the entertainment for purpose. i push away what I thought I needed for purpose because in purpose, God is going to bring me everything that I've been waiting for. So waiting, waiting is hard. And I want to let you know today that you got to wait without panicking. Because when you wait, it's a time of preparation and not a time of panicking. 
And no matter how long you wait, no matter how long uh, you are in this way, God has a purpose and a plan for your life. But it's important to understand that in his purpose and in his plan for your life, God wants you to understand that you got to endure the process of the wait. Look at your neighbor and say, endure the process of the wait. The reason that you must endure the process of the wait is because when you endure the process, you'll see the manifestation of God. And for some of us, we're in places where we want to be in control of things in the wait. Where you're in the wait at the grocery store and the line's not moving fast for you, what do you do? You go and get in another line. Yeah, I'm talking to you. The person with 40 items in a, in a 10 item only checkout line. I'm talking to me with a whole basket of groceries in the self-checkout, <laughs> holding up the whole line. <laughs> because when we're impatient, we'll take matters in our own hands. When you're impatient, and thank God for ways, but when you're impatient on the highway, you look for another route that's going to get you to your destination quicker than what you're in. When you're in the wait and you want to put matters in your own hands, you'll move out of the place of purpose and into the place of, of, of what you want to do for your own life. But it's in the weights of our life. Somebody say the weights. The weights of our life are not predicated on our toughness. It's not predicated on how we are yet sustaining in the things of God. Our weights are predicated on the place where you remove anxiety and the place that you remove fear. And you say, God, in this weight, I'll wait on you. It's when you put what you are waiting for, which is God, ahead of what you're wanting and waiting for, which is you. But it's in those places of waiting that causes us defeat. It's, it's in the doctor's office when you've, when you've gone and had the test and now you've had the MRI and now you're waiting for the results. You believe God, but in the wait, the weight of what the result could be is waiting on you. And let me tell you, it's okay to feel the weight in the wait. It's, it's in the wait of waiting, waiting. We've been dating for 10 years, bro, and I'm waiting on you to propose. I'm waiting. Like, how much waiting I got to keep waiting? And because it's been so long in the wait, now I'm doubting myself. Like, I'm not a good catch. The devil is a lie. Like, if I was good enough to get, I'm good enough to keep. Hallelujah, glory to God. And so in the wait, it'll cause our mindsets to shift in a place that's not of God. In the place of waiting, waiting, waiting. I didn't went to school. I didn't uh, graduated. I didn't went and got these certifications. And you still don't see my value to promote me, but yet you want to bring somebody else off the street ahead of me. The devil is a dog on liar. I will prevail because when God sees my value, he understands my value in my way. Who am I talking to today? That God not only sees your value, but he sees your value in your way. As a matter of fact, your value increases when you learn how to wait. I'm talking to somebody in this place this morning that feels a struggle in your way. God told me to tell you your value is about to go up. <laughs> they kind of ask you over here. Let me talk over here. Your value is about to go up as much as you learn how to wait. I need a whole church to say, I'm going to learn this thing. I'm going to learn this thing. I'm going to learn how to wait on God. What's important in waiting? What's important in waiting? Patience. The Bible says, let patience have her perfect work. And I always thought it was wonderful uh, how the Bible called patience a her. Because the truth of the matter is women are patient. They can feed a baby. Change a baby, cook dinner, cut the grass, change the TV, and rub your head all at the same time. If that ain't patience, I don't know what is. 
If that was a brother, we would have to hire five different people to do the job that they do. And I'm not ashamed to admit that. That God had to work with me in my patience. Because in my impatience, it caused me to put matters in my own hands. And for the majority of us, we too deal with the word patience. Patience is not having the ability to wait, but what patience is, the ability to, to watch your behavior while you wait. Patience is just not the ability to wait. Patience is watching your behavior while you wait. Because some of us will wait, but, but we got to talk while we're waiting. Some of us will go to the restaurant and wait. They already told you it's a 35-minute wait. And it's 34.60 seconds and you still complaining. You got to learn to change your communication in the wait. Your body language is saying you can't wait. I mean, you giving off can't wait vibes. I mean, you got you, you to gotta learn that, that your behavior in the wait is what matters the most. How is your reaction in the wait? How is your thought process in the wait? What are you saying while you're waiting? Because if you're saying while you're waiting, it, because it's taking so long, I don't think it's going to happen. I, I, I don't think it's going to manifest. I, I don't think this is the business for me. These are self-doubting talk, and I come to come against that talk in the name of Jesus that we got to learn to speak what God has for us because he said, I got thoughts of good toward you, not evil to bring you to an expected end. So it's how I wait. i got to change my behavior in the wait. And for the majority of us, patience does not come easy. Can we be true? We, we, we live in an impatient society. That's why we got Keurigs. For years, it was okay to take water, put it in the kettle, and heat up some coffee. And all of a sudden, somebody came up with an idea that's going to heat water super fast, concentrate it, and you don't have to go and waste all these coffee grinds and put it in this little pot, hit go, put your cup there, and there was the Keurig. Because we're impatient. What if I were to tell you that you're, that because of people's impatience, God has given you an answer for somebody's impatience? I bet you the man that invented Keurig is not complaining because somebody, you're impatient and you got one in your house. Because in your impatience, there is something that can be birthed from it, hallelujah, if you give it to God. From the decisions that we make in haste, our impatience causes us an uh, inflection and a reflection of what we can go through and the most importantly of how we go through it. As a matter of fact, impatience causes us most of our pain, impatience causes most of our damage, and impatience causes the most waste on this planet. Somebody say impatience. Impatience causes the most damage because when you try to rush the process, you circumvent the process. When you try to rush what God has for you, you put your matters in front of what God matters. When you try to rush, hallelujah, glory to God, what God has for your life and impatient, you'll try to move on your own time instead of God's time. We're not born with patience, but it's how we're taught to deal with patience. You got to teach your children. Yes, we're going to have dessert, but you're going to eat this food right here first. And I know you hungry, I mean, you're thirsty, but my mama told me you're going to eat this food before you drink some water. You might get two sips, but you ain't going to get full on all that drinking. No, we're going to eat first. It's, it's the patience. They had a study with some children, and, and they told these kids, we're going to give you a whole buffet of ice cream, but I want you to hold on to these marshmallows. And these were five-year-olds. And can you imagine what these five-year-olds were doing with these marshmallows? They were on the stage, and some of them were sitting there. After a while, they are like, man, we're going to have ice cream. It's going to be a Sunday party, and we're going to have a good time. But some of those kids got so uh, enlightened with the marshmallows, they started eating them. Because their self-gratification overruled their ability to have patience. But there were some kids that realized the end result was the ice cream party, and instead of eating the, the marshmallows, they started playing them with them. 
Because sometimes God will send a distraction of what you thought was a distraction only to get you to a place that you won't have your mind on what you thought was a distraction. But what God was trying to distract you from is don't settle on this because I've got something greater for you. Who am I talking in this building that you say I will not be distracted with this because I understand God has something greater for me. This leads us to the text that Jairus is on his way to Jesus with a need that his daughter is dying. Can you imagine what he's going through in his mind of dealing with that? His daughter is at the place of death, but the only thing he knew to do was to go to a man called Jesus because he had heard that Jesus not only was a way maker, but Jesus was a healer. And I want to tell you today that even in your place of life, it may seem unto death, but Jesus is not only a way maker, but he is a healer. Look at your neighbor and say, my God is a healer. Yeah, he's a healer. Jairus gets to Jesus, and he says, Master, my daughter is dying. I need you to come to my house. That sounds kind of Texas house. Man, it's y'all rubbing off on me. He said, I need you to come to my house quickly. Jesus said, I'll go, because that's how God is. He will meet you at the place of your affliction. He will meet you at the place of your need. He will meet you. He will stop everything that he's got going on because the world is in his hands. And and you got to believe that while you have a need, somebody else got a need. And while they have a need, somebody over in China got a need. But he's so powerful, he can meet all of our needs at one time. So he said, I'm going to put their needs on pause right now while I'm still doing their needs while their needs on pause. Because that's how good God is. And I'm going to come to your house. But there, he's interrupted by a woman who has this issue of blood. Now, if I'm Jairus, I'm marveled because I'm like, dude, you just promised me that you was coming to my house. And this is the year of manifested promises. And let me tell you that every promise God has given you and every promise God has said to you and every promise that God has spoken over your life is going to come to pass. But let me tell you, even if it looks like it's interrupted, it's still coming to pass. So Jairus is interrupted by this woman with the issue of blood. And you would argue to say, is her need more important than his need? We we do that with one another. Why they got a house and I ain't got a house? How did they get a house and their credit score is 24 and mine is 750? That's a miracle. You ought to be praising God with them that they was able to even get a house with a 24. But what's most important, if you learn how to wait with your 750, hallelujah, glory to God. God will do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think according to the power that works on us inside of you. Somebody say the process. He's the God of the process. There is a process in waiting. And there are interruptions that happen sometimes in your wait. And you got to learn to be okay with the interruption. I've learned in my life that that interruptions are sometimes necessary. Nobody likes interrupted, especially when you're talking. You better not interrupt me. You want to know one of my wife's pet peeves is interrupting her while she's talking. I'll be talking to her, and I'll have a talk back spirit on me, and, and, and I'll be like, and she'll be talking, and I'll be like, and I'm looking for my avenue to get in. And, I, and see, that's why you're talking. You just, don't, you just want to talk over me. I don't need an amen. But what am I doing? I'm trying to interrupt her communication. Because what I feel at the moment that what I have to say is more important than what she has to say. But there are some interruptions that when God is speaking, you got to let God speak over what you're saying. That sometimes when you say, I don't feel good, sometimes God says, no, you are healed. Hallelujah. Sometimes when you say, I'm broke, no, that's when God interrupts what you got to say and say, thou am blessed and highly favored. Sometimes when you feel like you're lonely, God says, you are not alone. I am with you even until the ends of the earth. Somebody say, God will interrupt my speech. So in the process, waiting is, it becomes an oral, oral dissertation. It becomes a place that you got to begin to speak those things which be not as though they were. J. Iris, what he did, he understood that in order for his daughter to be healed, he had to ask God for something. 
And I want to declare to you today that there are things inside of you that will come to you. There are some promises that God has for you. There are some miracles assigned with your name on it, but God is just waiting on you to ask. And some of you have not gotten what God's promise is for your life because you simply have not asked for it. But I declare in this place this morning that everyone in this place is going to begin to ask God what you want. How many believers do I have with me? Did you say, God, I'm ready to ask. I'm ready to ask. Hallelujah. Asking is a process. And you say, how do I ask, Pastor? Uh, uh, ask if you break it down. It's ask. The A is ask. The S is seek. And the K is knock. Somebody say, ask, seek, knock. So he began to ask God for what he wanted. What did he want? He wanted his daughter to be made well. The Bible says in Matthew 7, ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find, knock, and the door will be open to you. Some of us are standing at doors we have not asked for. I'm going to say it again. Some of you are at doors you have not asked for, and that's why the door is not open because you have not asked for it. You just showed up. But God told me to tell you in this season, God is sending you to some doors that you asked for, and you're going to know it's the door because as soon as you get there, the door is going to open up. Who am I talking to in this place that's waiting with anticipation that say, God, I'm ready not just for a door, I'm ready for the open door. Because in the waiting, when you learn how to wait, you'll stand behind a door that's locked, that's not giving you access, and you'll start entertaining yourself. When the reality, when God gives you a door that you asked for, he provided access. In other words, he gave you keys to open the door. Not only keys, but my faith says that there are some doors that God will give you that you don't even need a key for. That it'll just open with your presence. I'm talking to somebody. I'm prophesying right here in this place right now that God's about to send you a door that you've been asking for without a key. Hallelujah, glory to God. It's just going to open up. It's just going to move for you. You're just going to walk in it. Somebody say, I'm ready to walk in. So I move from asking. A lot of us stay, stay with asking God. We spend all of our lives asking God, asking God, I want a husband, I want a wife, I want a car, I want a house, I want to be healed. But how many of you are waiting to move from asking to seeking God? Yeah. Now we're talking relationship. Because in order for me to ask you something, i got to have a relationship with you. Now some of y'all are bold to ask without relationships. <laughs> Y'all just bold like them people on Instagram say, beloved, I, I want you to show $20,000. They do that in the DM. Don't know me from a can of paint. God, they said, God said, you, you lying. You lying. God ain't said nothing. But relationship. When I have a relationship with you and the relationship is solid, I can ask what I want from you. As a matter of fact, when I have a relationship with you and I built more than just surface relationship, I've got a thing called trust. If I invite Pastor Torrance to my house right now, I trust him enough that not only can he come and sit down and don't be nosy, but, but if he got a little thirsty, I trust him that he, I would trust him to go in my refrigerator. I trust him that well. But everybody, you can't say that with. Some people you can't trust in your refrigerator. Because they may see something they don't need to see. They went in there for ketchup and they, and they, and they eyes on something else. No, nah, you didn't go in there for, I can't trust you. Somebody say relationship builds trust. He had, he had relationship because he understood what he had heard about God and he wanted that for himself. And instead of being jealous of somebody else's miracle, you got to say to God, God, I don't want what they have. I want the relationship they have with you and the relationship they have with you can get me what I want. Who am I talking to in this place this morning that you say, I got to be jealous of Susie. I got to be jealous of Paul. I just want relationship with you because relationship gives access. The etymology of the word seek means to strive for something. It literally means to go after it. And what if I were to tell you today that some of us, we have not unlocked doors because you simply resolve at asking and not going after it. You want to be a millionaire, but are you going after the process of becoming a millionaire? 
You can't just sit around and pray and fast and expect money to come. It can come, but for most of us, we got to go out and go after this thing. I got to position myself around other people who are millionaires or on the way to millionaires, and we can become millionaires together, but I can't do this by myself without relationship. And this is hard for people who isolate themselves and and self-isolate because you might be a loner and you don't know what it means to have community. But God is calling you out of that place of isolation. And God is bringing you to a place of fellowship that where somebody else, God has blessed them, that what God has done for them, he can do it for you. I've got to strive for the seeking. It means to go after. It literally means to chase after what I've been wishing for, go after what I've been wanting for something to happen greater in my life. And let me tell you, it's the time now. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 and 1, now, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of the things not seen. The best part of that verse to me is the word now because now is faith. Now is my faith elevated. Now in the place of waiting, now my faith is elevated. I know I can't see how I'm going to become a homeowner, but now my faith is elevated. I may not have the right conditions. I may not have the right job. I may not have the money, but now faith is the substance of things that I'm hoping for. It is yet the evidence of things I can't see. You got to have the kind of God kind of faith that you can see it before you see it. So when it manifests, you'll know how to ascertain it and go after it. Somebody say, I got sight beyond sight. So I'm going after it. It's the time to pursue. And I want to encourage you today that this is your time of pursuit. This is your time of going after it. It's my time to go after every promise. It's my time to go after what he told me. It's my time to go after healing. Yeah, I'm going to take this pill, but I'm going after healing. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Because I'm going after every promise God has for my life. And I just don't want to stop with healing. I want to be whole. Some of us just want healing. No, I want to be whole. I want my mind to be whole. I want my body to be whole. Hallelujah. I want my thoughts to be whole. I want my life life to be whole. I want my children to be whole. I just don't want to settle for healing. I want wholeness. Somebody shout, I'm going after it. So there's a weight to this thing. There's a weight. Jairus is waiting because now he's interrupted. This woman with this issue of blood. And not only is he waiting, but, but can you imagine... It's so many people, she can't even, it, he can't even hurry up and get Jesus to his house because there's so many people. And, and she's crawling, trying to get to Jesus, and he got to wait. <laughs> Do you think, for happenstance, if she knew that his daughter was dying, would she have told Jesus, I'll wait on my healing and let him go first? How many of us would be like that, like that, in that, in that instance? Would you forego your breakthrough for somebody else to get theirs first? That's a hard question. Because all of us, we feel as if that our time of waiting is sufficient for us. We feel that our time of waiting is our own gratification because I waited, I deserve what's happening at the end of the line. And when somebody else cuts in front of us in the line, we just go ballistic. Let somebody get in front of me on I-10. This the car in front of me. This my car. And I just, I get a, a ignore spirit on me. I don't, I don't see you. I don't see you. And as soon as this car go, I'm, I'm, I'm on his tail. I know we got some officials in here, but don't let an ambulance come down the road. I'm right behind the ambulance. (laughs) Why do we do that? Because we don't like waiting. And we're impatient. But God says, in this moment of learning to wait and learning how to handle the wait, there is a far more exceeding weight of God's glory. Now, that's a scripture. That's in the Bible. He says, uh, there's a far more exceeding weight of God's glory. It sounds to me that God wants to trade weights. 
And what if I were to tell you today that there are some weights that are heavy for you? Yeah, you're in financial tribulation. Yeah, you, you never had a mother or father. Yes, you're in, in breakdown right now. Yes, you're going all these things that's going on in your mind all at the same time, and that's weight. But what if I were to tell you today that God wants to trade that weight for another weight? You say, well, God, I ain't signing up for that because I want you to take the weight. No, let me tell you, there is another weight called God's glory, that God wants to take the weights of your pain, that God wants to take the weights of your trauma, that God God wants to take the weight of what you've been going through all your life. God wants to take the weight of that abuse. God wants to take the weight of what you've been going through. And he said, I've got something better. I know it may be just as heavy, but it's called my glory. Who am I talking to in this building? Did you say, God, I'm waiting on your glory. God, I'm waiting to feel your presence because in your presence is fullness of joy. I'm trading the weight. He said, I'll turn your to your midnight, hallelujah, glory to God, in today. I'll turn your, your suffering, hallelujah, into some good things. Hallelujah. Matthew 11 says and 29 says, Come unto me, all who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He goes on to say, Take up my yoke upon me and learn of me. What is a yoke? A yoke, think about, think about a cow. And he's got this, this thing on him. But a yoke is designed for this cow to be able to be led by, by the farmer. The yoke is heavy in itself. And you say, you might, for, for, for the animal lovers, you say, why you got to put that on the cow? Because it's a point of a control thing that where the farmer wants the cow to go, that's where he's going to go. The Bible says that you got to put your hands to the plow and don't look back. Because if you look back, you're not fit for the kingdom. And what if I were to tell you in this place right now that God has has a yoke on your life and God is directing your steps because the steps of a good man are ordered by God and the fullness thereof. Who am I talking to in this place that you say, God, I'm ready for you to order my steps. I'm ready for you to tell me to where to go and what to do and what to say because you're, hallelujah, if you're heavy and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. He said, my yoke, this glory I have for you is easy. <laughs> And this burden, my burden, is light. Some of us are so burdened because we need to trade our burdens. He says, when you take on my burden, what is his burden? His burden is his will for your life. And this gets us beyond the carnality of who we are. When we start talking, God, what is your will for my life? What is your burden for my life? You said I'll be the head and not the tail. You said I'll be the lender and not the borrower. You said I'll be above and not beneath. That is God's will for our lives. But we also got to understand that God is a God of intersections. He's a God of intersections. What am I saying? Because it was on the road after he crossed over the sea on the way to Jairus' house that he was intersected with a woman that had a need. Hallelujah. And God will begin to connect things that don't look connectable. I'm talking to somebody in this place. You'll say, how do these two stories correlate? Because uh, God will begin to connect stuff that don't seem connectable. This woman is not at death yet, but she is, has an issue with blood. And one would argue, uh, one would begin to say that over time, after her money starts running out and she don't have no more money left, she can't get a quick fix no more. And eventually, she would have died. But God stepped in right in the nick of time in her place of being deprived for what she had and what she needed from God. She had faith enough to say, God, I don't need to touch you. All I'm going to do is touch you myself. Hallelujah. I don't need you to touch me. I'm going to touch you. That's what I meant to say. There are some moments in your life that you got to have the resolve to say, God, I don't need you to touch me. I'm going to touch you. I'm going to touch you right in this infirmity. I'm going to touch you right in this place of pain. I'm going to touch you right in this place of discomfort because, God, if I touch you, I know you're going to make a difference. So he's the God of intersections. He's the God of intersection. God will begin to rearrange some things for your life. He'll rearrange some things that already seem set in stone. Who am I talking to in this place that there has been some things in your life that seem like it's been set in stone? What, what am I saying? That, yeah, your uncle had this and your granny had this. I'm talking about ailments. And, and your, your great cousin had this. And they say, your, your A1C is going to be this. But the devil is a lie. It may say that in my DNA. It may say that in my bloodline. 
said, hallelujah, but no weapon formed against me, it will not prosper. I'm here to declare to you right now in this moment, it may seem set in stone, but God is a God of intersections. God will say, yeah, I know all them had that, but I'm doing something new in you. Created me a clean heart and renew the right spirit that's within me. He's doing a new thing. He's doing a new thing. We often think that, that things happen out of happenstance and circumstance. But what, what if I were to tell you that, that things just don't happen and pop up in your mind all of a sudden? That it's purpose in that. It's the process of waiting and being in a certain place at a certain time. But you got to begin to think about what God's providential plan for your life is. Because he makes no mistakes. And because God makes no mistakes, he will start what he wants to start. He'll stop what he wants to stop. And you thought they didn't love you no more. That was God stopping it. And you went into a spiral plane of depression because you were lonely. No, they, God was saving you for what was going to come. And you didn't find out until you got in your godly relationship that you praising God. God, I thank you. Hallelujah. That you sent them out of my life. Because there's some places and some things that God has to stop in order for something to start. He's a God of intersections. Isn't it, isn't it miraculous that God always gives you an idea for something great and you ain't got no money? God, why are you going to give me a million dollar idea and I ain't got no million dollars to make this million dollar idea and make it a million? Because <laughs> he's the God of intersections. Why do I say that? Because it's in the place of weakness there he is yet made strong. It's, it's this woman that had an issue of blood, not knowing how she was going to prevail. All she understood that she had to get to a place where she touched God. She got to a place that her mindset and her ability outweighed what she thought for her life, and she understood what God had for her life. And she crawled, she crawled, and she crawled, and she nailed herself to the place where she says, I don't care who's in front of me. I don't care that I'm not supposed to be here because I'm labeled unclean. I got to get to where my promise is. And I want to declare and encourage you today that some of you watching me right now that you're in a place you don't know how it's going to come, but I want to tell you that you got to get to it. You got to crawl, do whatever you got to do, but just get to it. Just get to it. Somebody say the process. So we get here to this, the last part of this verse, verse 45, verse 45, verse 45, I'm going to read this to you. And this, this, is, this is the blessing part, this is the blessing part for me of what God, what God has for me. Verse 35, he says, he says, while he was still speaking, while Jesus was speaking, people came from Jairus' house and they were saying to him, uh, your daughter, your daughter, bro, she already died. While Jesus was already talking, while Jesus already healed the woman with the issue of blood, here's some bad news. Cue up, no more bad news from the roof. I don't want no more bad news. I don't want no more bad news. Like, like it, it was enough trauma for me dealing with the fact that my daughter was already dying. It, it, was, it was trauma for me that I, I had to travel to where Jesus was in my mind knowing that while I was gone away from my daughter and being away from her that she could pass and not even be there. And I, I'm, I'm talking to somebody today that you, you're, you've gone through some trauma of not being in the right place because at the right time because you're, you're in fear of what could happen. But God told me to tell you he's sending peace your way. And, 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 and they, came, they came to his house with bad news and they said, your daughter has died and why do you bother the teacher anymore? As if God is not God. As if what you're going through, God can't make a difference in your life. As if what you have been faced with and what you have been abused with, as if what you don't have is anything too hard for my God. I'm asking you, why are you bothering the teacher? Overhearing Jesus overhears every conversation. What if I were to tell you that Jesus is overhearing the negativity that the enemy is speaking in your mind? What if I were to tell you that Jesus is overhearing the doubters that's doubting what you can be? And Jesus overhearing them, he says, he says, don't be afraid. All I need you to do is keep believing. 
Don't be afraid of what you are faced with. Don't be afraid with what you are seeing. Don't be afraid with what you're hearing. All I need you to do is have this one word, and that word is belief. He says, believe in me, and so shall it be. Jesus takes his disciples. Now watch this. This is key. Verse 37, he took with him, except Peter and James and John with him into the house. There are some people who are not designed to be around you in your place of resurrection. I'm going to say it again. There are some people who God is going to position around you in your place of resurrection. See, anybody could have came, hallelujah, glory to God, and been with her. If God has sent a word, they would have saw that she just got up out the bed. But there are some instances God wants to do in your life that's going to take a private matter. And I'm talking to somebody in this place. You've gone through some private matters. You've gone through some private hell. You've gone through some private things. And God sent me to tell you I'm positioning the right people who are going to know how to handle you in your place of vulnerability. Because everybody will be excited that she, if she got up because they could witness it. But everybody's not as designed to see a resurrection. And what if I were to tell you right now that God is resurrecting some things that have been dead. God is resurrecting some things that have been dormant in your life. Somebody shout, I'm about to get up out this bed. Yeah. Hallelujah. They came to the house of, of Jairus and look with him, understanding the uproar, and the people loudly weeping with him. They was crying because what they thought was going to happen. They thought it was over. They thought it was over. They thought the time was there. And see, other people crying will make you cry. But the devil is a lie. I'm not crying tears of frustration. I'm not crying tears of, of death. I'm not crying tears of sorrow. These are happy tears because I'm crying for what God is doing. I'm crying, hallelujah, because eyes have not seen. I'm crying because miracles are manifested. I'm crying, hallelujah, because I can't believe that God chose me to be a blessing to. Who am I talking to in this place? That you're just thankful that God chose you to work a miracle through. They was crying. Jesus had gone in and he said, why are you making all this commotion? She ain't even dead. You got to be in a place where you won't allow the misdiagnosis of others over your life to cause you to have a mindset of defeat and a mindset that you can't make it because people will misdiagnose you. Jesus says she is not dead. She is only asleep. And I will not let you try to self-inflict your judgmental spirit on me because I know what God has for me. And what God has for me is yes and amen. And who else in this building this morning that you will agree with me that what God has for you is not only yes, but it is amen. And why is it amen? Because when you say amen, it's sealed. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter if the conditions change. It doesn't matter what I do, that what God has for my life, when he says is yes, it's amen. Look at your neighbor and say it's sealed, huh? Hallelujah. It doesn't matter if I go broke. It's sealed. I'm going to get it again. It doesn't matter if they foreclose on me. It's sealed. I'll get another house. It doesn't matter if I total my car. The same God that gave me the first one is the same one that's going to give me another one. It doesn't matter if you say you don't love me no more. There's somebody else out there who does. I will not. I will not. N-O-T. My wife said I ain't the one, the two, or the three to let you make me feel as if I'm not good enough for the promises of God. No, 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 no. I'm in a new season. I'm in a new season. I'm in a new place in my relationship with God that with God, everything he has for me is coming to pass. Hallelujah. I'm in a new place in my mindset that all I got to do is think a thing and it's going to manifest. I'm in a new place in my life. Hallelujah. That whatever I put my hands to is going to come to pass. Hallelujah. I'm in a new place in my life to let people walk out my door. As a matter of fact, let me pack your bag. Hallelujah. You want some toothpaste? You want some cleaner? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to get you an easy pass because I, as a matter of fact, I need you to go real quick. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of you got to do people like Jesus did. Hallelujah. Judas, that what you're going to do, do it quickly. Go ahead and leave me alone. Hallelujah. Go ahead and leave. You've been playing games anyway. Hallelujah. I need the real one in my life. Hallelujah. It's time for me to be happy in this season. Hallelujah. 
I will no longer handle and hang on to a dead experience. I won't do it. I won't do it. I will no longer hang on to dead things. That's why there are cemeteries. Because it's a place for dead things to go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm not going there. I'll go, I'll go and visit and remember. Because sometimes you got to remember what used to be dead. We, what used to be alive. But it ain't alive no more. But I'm not going to go back there and live. I'll be a fool to go and, and build a house on that cemetery. I'll be a fool. No, because I'm in a new place. And where I was is not where God has taken me. And where I've been is not where God has taken me. And who used to go with me is not who God is taking with me right now. Somebody say all things new. So he said, why have a commotion and weep right here? She's not dead. She is only asleep. What if I were to tell you right here in this moment that there are some dead things that God is about to speak over your life. Hallelujah, glory to God. There are some dead things that God is about to say, get up, hallelujah. They began to laugh at Jesus. And in my clothes this, this morning, let me tell you, there's some people laughing at you because they don't believe what's about to happen for your life, but they need to put their seatbelts on because God is about to take them for a ride. Who am I talking to in this place? That let them laugh, hallelujah. Let them scream scorn you. Let them post about you. Let them subliminally post about you because Jesus said the child is not dead. Hallelujah. He says all y'all go outside. If you ain't for me, you gotta go. Hallelujah. If you ain't talking good talk for me, you gotta go. If you ain't doing what I'm doing, you gotta go. Hallelujah. In this season, hallelujah, I'm in a building season and if you ain't building, you gotta go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everything in my house gonna build. Hallelujah. The dog gonna bark. Hallelujah. The fish going to swim, hallelujah. If I got a bird, he going to fly. And if you ain't doing the purpose that God put on the inside of you, you got to find somewhere else to go. Tap your neighbor and say they got to go, hallelujah. Doubt has got to go, hallelujah. It has no place in my house, hallelujah. Fear has got to go. There's no room for that in my house, hallelujah. Tribulation has got to go. There's no room for that in my house. Somebody shout, it's got to go. So he took the father and the mother, watch this, all three of them, and they entered into the room where the child was. Sometimes you got to get to a quiet place where God is, where it's just you and God. You got to begin to put out all the noise, all the noise and the fear, all the noise of the naysayers, all the noise of the past, all the noise of the trauma. And believe me, the noise is going to talk loud. Hallelujah. Believe me, the noise is going to outweigh, hallelujah, what God has for you. But you got to drown out the noise. Somebody shout, I got to drown out the noise. I got to drown out the noise because if I don't drown out the noise my emotional wounds will start talking to me if I don't drown out the noise my trauma will start talking to me but the devil is a liar somebody shout the devil is a liar I'm going to drown it out. Hallelujah. I got to drown out the noise. And so they're in the room, three of them. Hallelujah. And the Bible says, hallelujah, in verse 41, taking the child by the hand, there's some times in your life that look dead. Hallelujah. And God says, I saw you in your place where you was, and I'm just going to grab your hand. Hallelujah. Come on and walk with me. Hallelujah. He's going to walk with me, and he's going to talk with me. David said it like this, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. He didn't say you wasn't going to go in the valley. He said even in the valley, I'm with you. Even in a place of darkness, I'm with you. Even in a place of fear, I'm with you. Even in a place where you and God, what you need, I'm with you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, hallelujah, I'm with you. Don't be fearful. Don't be afraid. Somebody shout, I won't be afraid in this season. I'm not going to be afraid in this season. I'm going to go get everything that God has for me. Hallelujah. I'm going to open myself up to love again. I'm going to open myself up for this promotion. I will not go back. Somebody shout, I'm moving forward. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. How is something that's meant to hurt me going to bring comfort? God told me to tell you, I'm turning some things around for you. What the devil meant for your bad. 
God is about to turn it around for your good. Who am I talking to in this building that you've gone through some bad tribulations? You've gone through some bad circumstances. God told me to tell you, I'm about to turn it around for your good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's about to turn it around. So he said, y'all get out of here. I got some work to do. This is her season. This is her time. Somebody shout, I got work to do. I got to build this business. Hallelujah. I got work to do. I got to get my money straight. I got work to do. I got to fix this relationship. I got work to do. I got to fix it from the inside out. I got work to do. I can't expect you to fix me. I got to fix me. I got work to do. I got to go to this counselor. I got work to do. I got to sit on the couch. I got work to do because if I don't fix me, I won't be good for you. I got work to do. Hallelujah. I got to go back to school. I got work to do. Hallelujah. I got to fix my credit. I got work to do. Hallelujah. I got to get my edges laid. I got work to do. Somebody shout, I got work to do. Hallelujah. So Jesus, hallelujah, I got work to do. Just because I got work to do. Don't mean I can't be looking good while I'm doing it. Hallelujah. I got work to do. God will give me a little break for me to get a haircut. I got work to do. Hallelujah. He takes the child by the hand. Watch this. And he said to her in a tender voice, Tahila Kumi. Talitha Kumi. And then watch this. It is translated in the Aramaic, which was the language of that place. The original, the original language of Jesus, the Aramaic. Watch this. He had to speak to them in a language that everybody else didn't understand. See, some of us, we have not resurrected what God wants to resurrect because we speak in the wrong language. And God told me to tell you, I need your language to change. I need you to change to your original language. You started talking because you started talking around the millionaires. Yes, uh, uh, the stock prices, the EPS, is this and that and all. No, you need to talk how you talk to Pookie and them. Because what, what you don't understand, Pookie and them need a financial advisor. And Pookie and them got some money under the mattress they need investing with. But the more you talk over their head, the more you ain't going to get the promise. Somebody say, right, so it's okay to be me. <laughs> it's okay to be me. He says in the original language, Talitha Kuma, which means, little girl, I say unto you, get up. <laughs> he said, now, now, you died. Everybody else confirmed you died. Hallelujah. Because in that time, uh, uh, in the Jewish culture, uh, they take death seriously. As a matter of fact, uh, when somebody dies in Jewish culture, they have to be in the ground before three days. And within 24 hours, before in 12 hours, the body has to be prepared. They literally, and the rabbi stays with them in the room where they are until they are committed. What if I were to tell you that God is a kind of God like a rabbi? That even when everybody else has diagnosed you as dead, he said, I'm going to sit here with you while they think you're dead. Because just like me, in three days, Kafia, you sang it. In three days, not only did I get up, I just didn't get up ordinary. I just didn't get up how I went in. But the Bible says in three days, he got up. But he got up with all power in his hands. What if I were to tell you today that you're about to get up? I'm going to say like Jesus said, Talitha Kuma, get up. Hallelujah. Get up out the pit. Get up out of your pain. Get up out of your grave. Take them grave clothes off. Get up out of your misery. Get up out of your trauma. Get up out of that one-bedroom apartment. Get up. Hallelujah. And not only are you going to get up, but God sent me to tell you, right here on 16219 Clay Road, God told me to tell you, you about to get up with all power in your hands. I dare you to start waving your hands. I dare you to start waving your hands. God sent power to our hands. God sent power to our hands. Power, as Deuteronomy said, to gain wealth. Power to make a change. Power to change our family. The power of saying to your family is in your hands. Hallelujah. You're going to lay hands on your uncle. Your uncle will get delivered. I'm talking in this place this morning. You're going to lay hands on your auntie, and your auntie going to get healed in Jesus' name. You're going to touch your mama. Hallelujah. 
and the relationship with your mother that's been estranged, God's going to heal her mind, and she's going to apologize for all the years. Watch this. Jesus said in his own language, Talitha Kumi, get up. He said, I say to you, not only did she get up, it is said that when a person loses the loss of life, that they have to learn the ability to live again. Some who have gotten to the place of death, when they come out, they may suffer with not being able to speak or not being able to have the strength of their limbs. But I want to prophesy to everybody in this place today that not only are you coming out of this, not only are you going to obtain power, but you're not going to look like or feel like what you've been through. The Bible says she got up and immediately, it didn't say tomorrow. It didn't say she had to go to physical therapy. Immediately she began to walk. You are about to walk into every manifested promise that God has for your life. That's not the blessing. The woman with the issue of blood, she was healed. This little girl was resurrected. Watch this. She was resurrected. We, we hear about this, but the most powerful resurrection that we hear is the story of Lazarus. But this is two miracles in the same chapter. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. In your next chapter, it's just not going to be one miracle. Somebody shout two miracles. I declare and decree right now that everybody under the sign of my voice, God, we're not going to accept just one miracle. God, we're looking for double our portion. God, if you did it for Elisha, do it for us. God, give us a double portion. Lift up the sound in this place and God say, give me a double portion. Coming double, 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 double. That molestation is going to pay you double. I'm seeing you in the spirit. Double. That conflict on your job that you've been waiting patiently for, this next position is double your salary. But in your wait, God wants to do some things privately for you. I close with this. He tells them, he tells them, says immediately those who witnessed the girl's resurrection they were overcame with wonder and amazement verse 42 but Jesus gave strict orders that no one should know about this and he told them to give her something to eat I want to declare to you in this next chapter of your life that you will be less vocal and more focal. Less vocal and more focal. Everybody don't need to know your resurrection because they can't handle it. He says, no one is supposed to know this. Let them see the after. You didn't already moved in, had the 
had the, uh, what do you call it, the housewarming party. And you didn't invite them. And they say, well, I wanted to bring you something. I got it. I, I, thank you. I take a gift card. Because the, the gratification that has once fulfilled you, God is moving you away from that. Because you, you used to like that kind of caring about. It made you feel valued. But God is getting you to a place that you'll value him more than you value everything else. Now, don't get me wrong. I like being valued. But this is a change of season and direction for your life. Everybody, every hand lifted. Every hand lifted. Every hand lifted. Jesus said to Letha Kuma, little girl, arise. I speak under the auspices of the Holy Spirit in this moment, and I activate every dormant, dead thing in your life. I declare in the name of Jesus that everything that has been on pause, God, we thank you that you're pressing play. God, we thank you right now, God, that even the weight, the afflictions, and the sufferings of this present time are not worthy, not even to be mentioned to the future glory that shall be revealed. God, we thank you for all these things that you're bringing to us. And God, we thank you for these people. And I pray right now at this, in this moment, God, that you'd give us the tenacity and the ability to understand that although weeping endures yet for a night, that joy comes in the morning. And God will be so careful to praise your name and glory in Jesus' name. Come on and give God praise. Amen. This offering time, come on and get your seeds of love together. Amen. Remain standing and get your seeds of love together. I want you to think about your seed today, that this seed that you're about to plant is going to be a life-altering seed. Amen. I know you came in, you came in with saying what you thought your seed was going to be today. But I want to change your mind. I want you to change your perspective. If you need an offering envelope, our ushers, our host team is bringing them to you. If you need to give electronically, there's information on the screen. If you're texting to give, please text LH West to 8457. The number's on the screen, excuse me. Uh, but make sure you type LH West uh, to give today. Amen. There's QR codes on the back of your chairs. Uh, we've made it so super easy for you to give. And we thank God for it. But I want you to get your seeds.